So, welcome everyone. I'm really pleased to be back on the Educational Psychothera Psychology Reach Out. I'm doing a presentation which I'm calling Nurturing Bubbles, um, which was prompted by when I discovered that schools were going to sort children into small groups, which they call bubble groups. So I thought bub a bubble is a small group of children, a little bit like a nurture base. And so I wanted to think a little bit about the advantage of a small group, uh, which could be very nurturing. So welcome to Nurturing Bubbles. Um, the, I shall share the screen with the PowerPoint that I've prepared. In a minute. <laughs> So Nicole, can we have the presentation? It's coming, right. Okay. Yes, I was thinking, and lots of people are saying this is the new normal um, because there's likely to be changes and then more changes. And also we don't know what's going to happen in the future. But it's also true that we're going to see small nurturing bubbles, hopefully, the children will be with teachers that they know well and hopefully they'll be with their friends that they know well and I just think as well as being coming to school with the anxieties around coronavirus which they've got from their family and from the news and from just seeing what's going on around them and then going back into school again is going to be a transition which they will need to adjust to. It is also a great opportunity for schools and school staff to put some effort into helping the children through this transition, talking things through with them, allowing them to play through their anxieties. Um, and you can see from the pictures, there's play with clay, which is really messy. And um, there's investigating with a friend and there's being in a bubble with people that you know, and there's times of calm and quiet, which will be important as well to develop the, uh, the inner world of children and to be with them. Um, so we'll go on to the next slide, thank you. Um, the choice of bubble group, it's probably a little bit late to think about this now because I imagine that most schools have already thought about who they're going to put with who, but I decided to add this slide in just yesterday because I heard of a school where they're dividing the children alphabetically. And the person who I was speaking to was saying that she's really glad that her son isn't going back to be in one of the bubbles, he's too old, because he would be devastated if he wasn't with his friends and his friend's um, surname is further on in the alphabet from him and so he wouldn't be with his friends. And I just think it's really important to keep friends together because they will be the people that the children have probably been in contact with either physically in a garden or in a field or on the internet through playing games together or speaking together. And I think not taking this need to be with someone that you feel comfortable with seriously may mean just another loss, another um, thing to adjust to, to getting on with children that you're not so familiar with or that you haven't chosen as your friends. I just think children will really need their friends. Of course, they will have the um, the teacher whom hope and possibly they'll have an assistant as well whom they know but the close friends will be really important for them and then of course they may need to redo their friendships and they might need help with this and we can see in the bottom picture um, a member of staff helping children and possibly um, conflicts will arise more than they normally do and they may need more help with this and this is not unhelpful because helping children to solve conflicts is how they learn and also how teachers develop the skills to do that. Thank you. So in a nurturing bubble, obviously the group of school is small and the advantage is they stay together. They have meals together, they have conversation, a bit like a nurture base, that's what happens in a nurture base. And they play together and it's very relationship based. And although there will be some learning going on, there'll be learning anyway going on through the play and through the talking and through whatever happens, 
um, I, it's a great opportunity to emphasize social and emotional growth and issues. And it's a unique opportunity for staff to tune in to the children. You can see in the top picture, the two children, they just look a little bit anxious and a little bit unsure. And teachers will have this in their class. And sometimes the behaviors that you'll see will be very subtle, maybe just facial expressions. But because there's a small group, children, teachers will have a particular opportunity to tune in and respond to children either by talking or giving them something thoughtful to do, or just by being near them and watching them. And as I say, it will be much like a nurture group. And you could say that the purpose of this group is not just to get them back into school and learning, but it's to restore well-being, balance and security because children can't learn, they can't function if they don't have a secure base. I expect many of you listening know about attachment theory and one of the foundations of attachment theory is that you need a secure base in order to function. And what you might see is some children acting out like this little girl sticking her tongue out because she just can't cope and because she's projecting probably her cross feelings onto someone who she knows well, possibly a teacher or a member of staff. And nurture groups are for children who need more focused re relationship-based support to redo their secure base. And that's what probably all the children going back into school will need. Of course, the children will vary and some of them will settle in quickly. And some of them may have made great strides in their learning and want to get straight onto the learning. But there will be quite a number of children, hopefully who will come. I'm aware that not all children will probably come but hopefully they can be encouraged to come by both the school staff and the parents to, to make the best use of this opportunity. So now we'll think a little bit about the nurture principles, which can help us think about op the opportunity of this nurturing bubble. The first one is children's learning needs are to be understood developmentally. You could say children's needs are to be understood developmentally. What you see in the classroom um, can relate to emotional development as well as physical development. And the first thing is, with a small number especially, you have the opportunity to be child-centred, um, which may mean different children doing different things at different times and may mean lots more play. I think I'm thinking particularly about the nursery reception in year one here in this um, presentation. Some of it may apply to the year six children but I'm thinking particularly of the younger ones. Um, I've, Why Can't You Hear Me is the subtitle of my recent book. Um, and I think children will really need to feel heard. And feeling heard isn't just hearing what they say, but it's hearing what they communicate, maybe through their play or through their behavior. And child-centered includes child-directed activities. So they may have options, things that they can go to, different um, play opportunities or creative opportunities or learning opportunities so that the teacher can tune into their interests um, as well as their communications. And also it, some children will regress. They will regress through their behavior. Um, it may be they'll turn in on themselves or they'll act out more in a way which possibly they didn't do before. And this needs to be accepted as where they're at at the moment and as a communication. And they may need more um, earlier developmental um, responses. For example, attachment-based play, which is a bit like the early play which mothers and babies do to build up the relationship, to build the bonding. Um, in the picture, you can see a teacher with two children skipping around and laughing and maybe singing. And attachment-based play is very much about the relationship. Um, it includes eye contact and music, song, and little games, which you, you'll keep fairly close. Oh yes, that's something I do need to say, that I sourced these pictures from the pictures which I used for my book project. They're actually in the, um, they're most of them used in the Safe to Learn presentations, which are part of the e-resources attached to my book. And so I paid for the pictures, so, I, so the, the pictures are not socially distanced. So I'm really sorry about that, but I'm sure that 
um, school staff listening would be able to take what I'm saying, but adjust it a little bit to the need for social distancing, according to government guidelines. And the other thing to say is that when we're beginning to develop relationships or when we're needing to redevelop relationships, um, dependence comes before independence. In other words, the children may be more dependent than they were before they start to manage things more independently. Of course, they'll vary. But if a child becomes more dependent, we can just understand that as a sort, not just a regression, but a need that they need to go through before they move into independence. Thank you. And of course, the safe base will need to be recreated within the bubble. And this will be very possible because of the regular routines, which are familiar and predictable, which the teacher will organize. And because of the relationships, which will be there all day, every day. And the adults, which will all probably already be significant. And sometimes this, this may be difficult because the children, children are not used to relating to their teacher they may be slightly embarrassed or uncomfortable and they may be difficult to contact but just stay with it without pressure but with availability and attunement thank you the third principle nurture is important for the development of self-esteem and i think of self-esteem as an inner um, confidence an inner um, picture of how we view ourselves and for children who haven't had um, nurture which all children need and, and um, in ideal situations all children will have but not all children sadly may have had the sort of nurturing relationships which they really need and especially at this lockdown period things could have been very stressful at home everybody could have been under pressure and stress because of all sorts of things, maybe financial, maybe just being, being closed in a small space, etc. And so the children will need more nurture and their self-esteem will need to um, grow on its own from the relationships which they experience in school, as well as those at home. And I think working with the parents may also be a possibility as the children leave and teachers can have um, distance conversations, small conversations with the parents on a daily basis. So what facilitates this is the relationship-based um, approach. Relationships being containing, that means that when a child communicates something, the teacher or the um, teacher assistant um, feels it and accepts it and wonders about it and then possibly responds. And the responding may be in words or in gestures or in eye contact, et cetera. Um, the other thing about nurture is that it's a very homely. So you can see the picture at the bottom with a little group. This child looking at the camera is feeling like an outsider and she's finding it difficult. And she's obviously not under pressure to join. But what you find in nurture bases is that sometimes children do stay on the outside for a period. And then when they're ready, they come and join. And they do really want to join, but they find it difficult. And it needs to be, the encouragement needs to be slow paced. The movement between activities may need to be slow paced. And also being open to the present moment and noticing when a child is ready for some interaction or some thoughtful comment or some new task, etc. Nurture principle number four is about language. Language is a vital means of communication. So language needs to be thoughtful, which is thoughtful from the child's point of view. Circle time is particularly helpful. It's possible to have the children around you in a socially distanced way to share experiences. And those children who can't share, I think I talked about it on a previous webinar, benefit from hearing other children sharing their thoughts and feelings. The teacher might introduce the subject or a child might bring something up and everybody might think about it. Or they might use puppets um, or a little bit of drama. And then those who can't share can hear other people thinking together and they can know that it is possible to think about things, even difficult sad things and hurtful things together. And everything can be talked through in the moment. And the other thing about 
um, communication and language is that you will find as the children settle into the secure base that they will start to grow. And when you notice children managing something that they haven't managed um, in the beginning of the week or the previous week, it can be really helpful to acknowledge the growth and to acknowledge, goodness me, look what you're doing now. And I remember last week, you really struggled to be part of the group. You really struggled to manage whatever it is. I think you're growing stronger. What do you think? And so it's slightly different from praise, but it's a very authentic way of noticing that things are changing from the child's point of view. And they can think about it as well when you say, what do you think? Um, awareness of feelings, really important because it may be a little bit more difficult to actually talk about feelings, but feeling because and because feelings have been quite um, difficult to think about and a little bit scary perhaps and quite anxious. Um, on the other hand, this is the way we come to terms with things by being able to process them through talking and through play um, and through words. Maybe feelings charts on the wall may be really helpful at this time. And you can see the children in the bottom picture, they're communicating with each other. This might be a really good idea using those yogurt carton um, telephones, um, which we used to make. Repair. I'll just say a little bit about repair on the previous slide, which is when things become difficult. This isn't just a difficulty, but it's also an opportunity to repair the relationship, not just between children, but between the teacher and the child. Maybe the child has had an outburst or the child has done something which they maybe later seem to regret. And then the teacher can talk about this, not in a way which is um, sort of critical or punitive. I mean, there may need to be some consequences, but the repair is more about acknowledging that they probably wish it hadn't happened, but it doesn't mean that I'm not still here for you and I'm not still caring about you and thinking about you and I'm still available for you, etc. So the children experience that it's possible to to repair things, to that the relationship will go on, even though there will be ups and downs. Stories are helpful and play and art will think a little bit more. And stories are very helpful for children to engage with, for the older ones to write, not just to write things down, possibly write experiences, but also write stories about, I don't know, being on a desert island or being somehow by yourself or in a small group and unable to get out and how you manage that time. Thank you. So the next um, nurture principle, number five, all behavior is communication. I added the word unconscious because the children aren't aware that it's communication. So there's another, this little girl at the front, she's obviously communicating that she doesn't feel comfortable and that there's something on her mind. You may wonder, you can look at the pictures and wonder what the children may be communicating. You might want to use this for um, training of staff, I guess. And then the child in the middle with, who's screaming, the teacher is obviously finding it very difficult. Um, transference, I've used the word transference. I don't know how many people understand that. That is about the feelings which a child puts into you, which can be very painful. And this may be more common than it normally is. Um, in the sort of children that you wouldn't expect to put powerful feelings inside you. And it's not just about managing the feelings, but it's about wondering what they might be communicating, what feelings they're communicating, and also tuning in to the feelings that you're feeling in response to that, maybe with knowledge of the child's history and their patterns and their tendencies. And then reflecting on how you might respond, maybe reflecting alone for a minute, or talking through with colleagues later on. That's a really important thing. And wondering about links to what's been happening at home and during this time, or even what's happened today. And another thing to remember about when children do escalate into um, outbursts is that movement, this would, you can't really do this when they're actually in the outburst, but you can do it when it, it appears to be arising or when it's calming down. Movement dissipates adrenaline. So running, jumping, pulling, pushing, um, all of that can help the adrenaline flow through and calm the child down. And also taking a break, especially as you sense that um, their feelings are beginning to bubble up, 
taking a break, going, having a walk around the school for some reason, um, having a drink can change our state. I've just realized I've made a mistake. It should be our state. <laughs> Thank you. So transitions are significant in the lives of children. Nurture principle number six. Um, a few indicators of anxiety around coronavirus. We've talked about these. Regress behavior, obviously. Regress work. It may be harder for them to ask for help or to use help because that's relationship based. You've got to actually go up to someone and ask. They may be more easily triggered, more difficulty engaging. They may have fears. Some children may not want to go outside, especially those who have been living in flats and who've not been outside very much. Um, they may have increased resistance to doing what they're asked because perhaps at home they've just not been able to engage with any work and they've just done whatever they wanted. And so being asked to do something may feel like being bossed about. And so they may find this difficult at first. And this needs to be talked through with them. They may have anxieties about all types of changes and about losing things. I was just having a conversation with Nicole about some schools I've heard are having children in two week blocks. And I was thinking that for some this will be fine, but for the more vulnerable ones and for those who are finding this transition time difficult, that may be just another change which they have to adapt. And you may see this sort of anxiety coming out metaphorically in getting particularly anxious about losing things or not being able to find the things that you want. And they may be more irritable or they may be more hyperactive, like the boy in the picture at the bottom or they may close up like the boy in the middle, not want to engage at all. It, can, it probably will evoke a lot of sadness in you, which we need to contain. So a small bubble group enables time to observe and notice. Regulation activities. Self-regulation arises out of what's called dyadic regulation, which is if you think of a toddler or a maybe a one-year-old, begins to be able to regulate their own behaviour by having the parent there to help them come down after a hurt or an outburst or after something very exciting. And in school, we can practice regulation, which is our feelings bubbling up and then calming down. And I've just given you a photo of a parachute. So up the parachute goes and right down. And it's important to finish the process going right down to the ground and having a moment of calm before you do the next one, if you're thinking of it as a regulation activity. You can use music or clapping or dance, you know, rising and falling or drama, like an ice cube melting, etc. All these things about metaphorically bringing ourselves down to a still place after our feelings have been bubbling up. So emphasizing social and emotional intelligence. I've been thinking about that. But this is really important for adults. If you think of people who are really successful and really good to work with, they're people with emotional and social intelligence. Having a high IQ and having lots of knowledge isn't the only thing which we need to work on. So this is an opportunity to work on this um, with a small group. Um, and time to work through triggered states. Teachers will know children who've been easily triggered into anxiety. And these children will need particular watching and particular attunement at this time. And less pressure on learning objectives may enable more time to play, particularly child-centered play. You can see the little girl in the picture at the bottom. Um, she's using toys to, it looks like she's talking something through with them or playing something through. Thank you. Uh, rhythm, music and dance, philosophy for children. Um, I know of a child who's asked his grandfather to think about philosophy with him. He's a year six child and he's go been going into all different philosophies. This is obviously a very bright child. And so thinking things through for older children will be really helpful as well. Sensory activities, body awareness, all these help to dissipate um, the, the hormones like cortisol um, and adrenaline running around in the brain and also the sort of unhelpful um, neuronal links in the brain. So sensory uh, work and body awareness. Um, and these children at the bottom, they're doing yoga, I think. So yoga is enhances our awareness of our body, which includes breathing and the different parts of our body, which we focus on. 
as we um, hold positions. And of course, art and expression work, wonderful um, for working things through because uh, we start off by doing a picture and it turns into what it turns as we, as we engage with it, given time. And the last thing to say is a little bubble at the bottom. And it came to me that one could even have a nurturing bubbles visualization of being held in a safe, warm, nurturing bubble with rainbow colors. And maybe school staff might like to um, create a little visualization which the, the children can do with their, maybe their heads on the tables or lying on the floor and imagine a safe place in their nurturing bubble. So, thank you. I'm just wondering if we're coming to the last slide, if there might be anybody who might have some questions that they might like to post, because in a minute, um, we'll have a chance for questions. And so the last thing to say is about the importance of supporting each other and debriefing each other. So if we are aware that something has been on our mind and we really don't want to take it home or it's undermining our confidence, because it will be difficult for teachers to adjust to this new way of working initially. Some may take to it like a duck to water, I suppose, because of the advantage of, of a small group. But others may find it understandably anxious because there is a lot of anxiety around in all of us at the moment and so listening to each other as I say these um, school staff are sitting a little bit near you could do it with them sitting a little bit further away it's just the process of listening and reflecting together on the difficulties which the children may have put into us as I say the transference or the counter-transference which is our own anxieties um, impinging on the work we're able to do with the children. And this is not wrong or bad. This is just something which we can use to help us understand the children and ourselves and to develop our own capacities. So finally, this time as an investment, use it. I leave, my, leave you with my um, website in case anybody wants to um, look up things that I've been doing in the past and also the details of my book and all of these um, thoughts and approaches are explored in it in the book. Thank you. So I'm just wondering if there's going to be any um, questions. Let's have a look. Oh, I can see there's one there already. Um, thank you, Angela. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about how using drama could be helpful for the children. Drama is a great um, creative opportunity. I think just giving them a little setting and then maybe letting it take its course um maybe giving them a problem something to do with feeling isolated i think with the older ones they could probably develop their own drama maybe even in small groups or in the class um and allowing things to come up and then with the older ones interjecting a problem um, or interjecting a feeling and then they can create a drama and then they can share them with each other. With the younger ones, I like to use drama in the middle of the circle time um, setting, which is that you have the children around watching. And then, in fact, you could dramatize something that had happened in the classroom on that day. Or you could just dramatize a little conflict between two characters and have two volunteers to play the, the drama and talk about the conflict and they play it out. And then the people in the circle can come up to a child and put their hand near the child and talk the feelings that they think the child is feeling and then go and sit back down. And then the drama continued. Another child can come up maybe to the other child and talk their feelings from their point of view. So it's about understanding the feelings which might come up in a conflict between children, or it could be between a child and an adult. So one of the children will act the adult. Um, any, any situations which arise in their play could be dramatized in this way. And the helpful thing about having the children coming up and putting their hands near the child that they're going to express their feeling is that everybody can join in, even though only one or two children are acting. Of course, teachers may have their own ideas about how to use drama, but that's just a couple. Thank you. Let's see if there's any others. What are your thoughts about supporting long-term mental health of children and young people? Yes, I saw on the 
um, something just came up, I think it came up through to my email account actually, an article by some psychologists in a paper, um, or it could, could have been in a magazine, about how psychologists are very concerned about the long-term mental health of children and actually saying that the government needs to take the long-term mental health of children seriously as much as the physical risks of coronavirus because otherwise we're going to be left with lots of children with anxieties which they didn't have before and staying at home for some children long term is going to exacerbate the maybe already beginning mental health difficulties or children who didn't have them is going to start developing anxieties and the more that they stay at home for longer the more they get used to some children perhaps just being a little bit wild or being very resistant or struggling with re parental relationships. Um, so I think this needs to be balanced with the need for physical safety and um, health safety. Um, obviously supporting long-term mental, I think all the things that I talked about actually, attunement, noticing subtle communications, taking behavior as a communication rather than just something that has to be managed. Um, and lots of nurture. And nurture can be offered to children of any age. I've certainly heard of nurture bases in secondary schools. And I think maybe this needs to be taken much more seriously and also more investment in mental health. Um, I remember the Children's Commissioner for England, Anne Longfield, saying quite a long time ago, it would have been probably in December, about um, how it would be great if every school could have their own counsellors and they haven't achieved it yet, especially I think she was thinking about secondary schools having counsellors in primary schools to have play therapists or educational psychotherapists, as well as counsellors who can use play with the older children um, is very valuable. But I think the nurture and the primary relationship to be comfortable, firstly with a dependent relationship, and then to be able to feel safe in a relationship and to be able to ask for help, all these things are building the foundation for mental health. I wonder if there's any more. Let's going to have a look. Uh, no, I haven't got another one at the moment. Um, as I say, I'll just say that I've written this book, it's called Understanding, Nurturing and Working Effectively with Vulnerable Children in School. And it's all about this way of thinking with lots of examples and especially lots of thinking and examples about nurture bases. Um, of course, nurture bases were developed by Nurture UK and please um, check out their website and they're prob they might even be doing some webinars of their own, I don't know. And that's all about um, schools being able to develop their own nurture bases, but also about developing nurturing schools. And in fact, the last chapter in my book is all about a nurturing infant school, which has got the nurturing school whole school award, um, because all the staff in all the classes work a nurturing agenda, which includes lots of support for each other. Um, and lots of thinking things through together. And actually in this particular school, one of the assistant heads has um, done some extra training and she is able to supervise staff on an as needed and a regular basis. It just makes a huge difference. Their behavior has changed dramatically and the children are just so secure. And I, I, I know that she's been keeping in touch with all the vulnerable children um, on a, sometimes a daily basis and their parents and I am, haven't phoned her, but I, I did think of doing it because I imagine that most of the vulnerable children will be going back because the relationships have been actively sustained and real throughout this time. It's all about relationships, really. Thank you. So I think we might be coming to the end. We've certainly done more than half an hour. Um, let me just... So I think it's now going to be time for me to finish and it's been lovely to talk to you and to have this opportunity. Thank you very much to Educational Psychology Reach Out for giving me this opportunity to share some thoughts with you again. And I wish you all the very best in your work with the bubbles in making them nurturing bubbles. Thank you.